What's going on, guys? This is live stream 30, and the question of the night is, are tanks still relevant on the modern-day battlefield? There's some, been some back and forth. Uh, we've seen a lot of stuff going on in Ukraine, so uh, we're going to kick this around, okay? And this is on the heels of the Marine Corps divesting completely of their tanks. Um, and that was the big you know, topic of conversation leading up to before Ukraine. So now we're seeing actual combat footage of main battle tanks getting... For lack of a better word, their shit pushed in. So uh, we're going to talk about that tonight, guys. We got the uh, usual suspects on the panel tonight. So going around the horn, introducing everybody. First and foremost, we got Chad, my good buddy. Served together in Bravo 123. Deployed together at Helmand Province, Afghanistan in 2011-2000 time, uh, time frame. Chad's a veteran of OIF-1, the initial invasion, and went back in OIF-2 and fought in the Battle of Fallujah. He's studying for his military doctorate's degree. He's a wealth of knowledge, always brings a intellectual uh, point of view to the chat. So, Chad, welcome on tonight, brother. Thank you. All right, next we got the good Bruce. Bruce, my right-hand man. Hardly find any videos on my YouTube channel without him in it. Uh, Bruce at Camp Armit also has his own YouTube channel. Bruce brings a civilian perspective to the group, which is badly needed. <laughs> he also has a uh, his own Instagram called Bruce at Camp Armit. He's a armorer. He also does a lot of seracoding work. And if you guys have not seen his work on his Instagram page, it's phenomenal, especially his XM177 E1, which I'm sure he's going to give to me one day. <laughs> Anyways, Bruce, welcome to the chat tonight, brother. Thank you. All right, next we got the good doc, Dr. Christopher Larson. He's the original founder of the One Shepherd Leadership Institute going 40 years strong. Doc served in the Army. He's an NCO. He served in Korea, 38th Parallel, hooking and jabbing with the North Koreans from time to time. <laughs> He's an accomplished author. He's written many books on small unit tactics. He's an amazing wealth of knowledge. Doc, thanks for coming on tonight. Thanks for having me. And then uh, one person we're lacking, but we're hoping he jumps on here very shortly, is Les with Pegasus Test. So hopefully he gets in here pretty quick. Wait, wait. Are you saying... That for once I'm not the last. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> last minute Larson is not last minute Larson tonight. Although you did jump on seconds before we went live. That's right. <laughs> you were technically not the last person. Uh, so, anyways, guys, I'm going to go around the horn and uh, give you guys a little opportunity to say your piece and kick this uh, off before we uh, open it up to the floor to the table. So uh, let's go, Chad. You got the con. All right. Uh, so are tanks still relevant? I would say yes. Um, as long as our enemies have them, China and Russia use heavy armor. So I, I think they are relevant. Um, I think a more important question, though, is are tanks relevant in counterinsurgency or small wars? Uh, we saw some issues in Vietnam where armor played a minor part. Same with our two more recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, tanks are vulnerable in counterinsurgency. They were typically used for base security in Vietnam or really limited to the roads where ambushes waited in the jungle. In the global war on terror, they were introduced to 3D terrain and IEDs. Now, <clears throat> on a side note here, flame tanks were a little more useful. They were actually used in Vietnam to some extent and uh, may have been useful in larger battles during the global war on terror. But, you know, that darn protocol three of the Geneva Conventions, uh, certain conventional weapons, but I digress. Um, in Fallujah, we operated with tanks. They're great when you're being shot at, but um, I've actually seen the D9 bulldozer, which is an up-armored bulldozer, be much more effective at leveling a building than a tank. Um, you know, like I said, we do use tanks, but did they, did they make a difference in counterinsurgency? I, I would argue that the immense cost of our Abrams tank versus the actual combat effectiveness in counterinsurgency makes it an ineffective tool. Uh, you know, COIN is a special operation that requires specialized regular forces as well as special operations forces. Armor like APCs that can safely carry infantry or even light armored vehicles are much more effective than COIN than heavy armor. Of course, right now we're gearing back towards conventional warfare and moving away from COIN. So I think we might might need a resurgence of, you know, taking a, taking a second look at tanks and their usefulness on the battlefield. Well said, Chad. Um, unfortunately, um, I think that tanks are, are becoming less and less useful every uh, fight that we have. And that has been true since World War II. 
Um, I'll hopefully get into that a little bit more in 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 the future of this stream. But um, I think that we've seen them become less and less effective. The only thing they seem to be really effective against is other tanks. So if you're fighting some type of foe that doesn't have a lot of conventional armor, they are less and less effective. They seem to be extremely vulnerable in urban areas. And let's face it, the world is building up more and more every day, and we're getting more and more urban areas. Um, they're great at engaging targets at very long range, but those have to be large enough targets for them to actually engage and hit. If it's something like infantry tr targets or fixed emplacements, artillery is a, a far better, does a far better job than, um, than, than a tank would, which is trying to be sort of a jack of all trades, trying to be a, a portable artillery piece that can also take out armor. And the difference between artillery used against soft targets and, and, and a, a, gun used against a hardened target are very different and they don't seem to do that. They don't seem to do that too well. So um, I think that, uh, again, I'm a huge fan of tanks. I hate to see them go. I hate to see that the Marines are getting rid of them. But if I take my sort of personal bias out of it, and my love of, of armor, um, it just makes sense. Put yourself in the situation. Do you want to be in a tank going into, into uh, a modern combat battlefield or would knowing that someone with a simple man portable weapon can take you out and that man portable weapon cost i mean a fraction of what the tank costs tanks are extremely expensive they really always have been they take a lot of material they take a lot of man hours to build and they take a lot of maintenance to keep up and running and a lot of support a lot of fuel and and those things are all negatives when it comes to having a big piece of armor out on the battlefield i just feel that the, the fewer conventional tank on tank battles that we see, the less likely we are for them to remain relevant on a modern battlefield. All right. Hey, David Workman, uh, good to see you. What is up? The sky is still up in, in spite of everyone claiming it's falling. Um, and so, yeah, let's uh, have a beer to this evening. Um, Sage, the red thing behind me is called a Tory. It is the symbol of the 187th Rakasan uh, Infantry, and that is my regimental affiliation. So the Rakasans, uh, that's what that, that is. Been around since World War II. Um, all right, are tanks still relevant? You bet, and if you wanna win, you better have tanks. And we could just end that here, but of course, I see a lot of comments already in, in the board here, and, and my panelists, my fellow panelists, are of a very different opinion. Um, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. There will come a day, I don't know, it might happen in the next 50 years, more realistically, it'll be two to 500 years from now, that tanks as we know it will evolve and they'll, as we know them, they'll no longer uh, be relevant. And, and what I mean by that is, at one time we called tanks cavalry. Well, sometimes we still do. And we all know, oh, he means horses. Well, there was horses and chariots and everything else that over time has evolved to what we now call the tank since World War I. And so in the next 200 or 500 years, maybe a little later, we will see tanks further evolve so that you won't be able to recognize it. But its role will still exist. And as of today, you aren't going to win without tanks. I'm just telling you, you're not going to win. You're only going to win without tanks if the other side really just doesn't want to play and isn't that interested in winning. So, um, uh, and, and we're now going to talk tonight about Ukraine, and that's appropriate, and so let's do that. But, um, but I will bring up that in the Battle of uh, 15th century, Henry V went into the Battle of Agincourt, and no one, up to that point, no one had beat heavy cavalry. So they just didn't think it could be done. And they were caught without, the French caught the English without heavy cavalry in Normandy. Um, and then the longbow and the legend of the longbow comes in. How critical was the longbow? Very. Was it the single winning factor? It's debatable. But the point is that it checked heavy cavalry. Okay. Um, so there you go, Henry V at Agincourt. I would say tanks reigned not just superiority, but dominant in the battle space up until shortly after the invasion of France. 
when what happens is there's prolific um, small arm, anti-tank small arms, okay, bazookas and Panzerfaust and things like this. Because prior to that, the way to defeat a tank was to get a big enough gun and haul this thing around, whether it's with a horse, with a Jeep, whether it's self-propelled, and that's how you defeated a tank. But it wasn't until we came up with shoulder-carried anti-tank weapons that you see the um, the reign, the dominance of the tank on the battlefield uh, checked. And that check still holds true today, all right? I, let's recognize that tanks have their vulnerabilities, they have their uses, and there's places where, and we'll, we'll discuss that, I'm sure, places where they're not particularly useful. But all said and done, if you're gonna win, you better have tanks or you aren't gonna win. Well, that's well said, Doc. Uh, all right, so my, my perspective on this, uh, and this is a good conversation to have. Uh, so, you know, leading up to the war, in, the war in Ukraine, you know, there was a lot of conversation about the Marine Corps making the decision to divest itself of tanks. But um, I want to remind people that the, the number one reason why we were doing that is not that tanks were no longer useful. Um, sure, you know, anti-tank weapons have come a, a long way, okay? Very devastating effects, you know, top-down attack and whatnot. Uh, but the ultimate reason why the Marine Corps had divested of its tanks was to make room on ships and to make Marine infantry squads more lethal, i.e. every squad is going to have a javelin within it, okay? And then the, the cost versus benefit ratio of having those tanks was not worth it. All right. The juice wasn't worth the squeeze. And when you think of how much space uh, is actually being taken up by having a tank on board, are tanks effective? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I've got many, many fond memories uh, from the Najaf Cemetery when Abrams did show up and they were uh, fighting alongside with us, being employed properly. All right. You don't send tanks into specifically an urban environment without infantry dismounts on the ground providing cover for those that that armor. Um, the anti-tank guided missiles and stuff that we're seeing, you know, all over the news. Guys, these things have been around for forever, <laughs> right? Let's, let's go back to the uh, Yom Kippur War, early 70s, you know, where Egyptian tanks, or excuse me, Israeli tanks ran into Egyptians armed with saggers and just absolutely annihilated the Israeli tanks, when they first encountered them, they had to change their tactics. Okay, so this is this is all this is. The tank is still a unbelievably effective weapon. Um, it's just you know you have to you have to change the tactics. Obviously, as uh, Doc already pointed out, when you have bazookas and Panzerfaust entering the battlefields in World War II, you know it wasn't it wasn't the same ball game anymore. Or it was different. Okay, now individual infantrymen essentially have the capability of knocking out tanks as long as they hit them in the right spots, right? Tactics, tactics evolve, weapon systems evolve. I'm sure eventually we're going to see uh, countermeasures that are effective against top-down attack anti-tank missiles. Uh, we're already seeing uh, crude, you know, devices such as cages on these Russian tanks being put over. Uh, but I think what we're seeing a lot of in uh, the Ukraine specifically, is tanks aren't being employed correctly, right? We're not seeing these tanks going. We're seeing tanks going into villages without dismounts. Uh, at least some of the videos I've seen from some of the, the drone footage in Ukraine is showing that. And it's like, this is basic shit that, you know, that was, that was used and learned in World War II. Um, so I think that is one of the main reasons for uh, some of the heavy, heavy losses that we're seeing is in terms of armor in the current conflict in Ukraine. But do I think... Armor is still relevant on the battlefield, absolutely, and I think effective countermeasures are going to be eventually developed, if not already, you know, being put out there on you know NATO NATO tanks, uh, and presumably, I'm sure the Russians and Chicoms are, are looking in as well. So, anyways, that's my two cents, and I think we got the good less just checked in, but I see an empty chair. Nope, there he is. What's going on, brother? Can you hear you? You hear us, Les? All right, well, while he works on his comm issues, I'm going to open it up to the floor, guys, and uh, we'll kick this around. So who wants to take it first? Go ahead, Doc, but you're muted. Yeah, I mean, it's 
you know, I'll take uh, Les's right away here because he's he's not talking. But um, yeah, I mean, so so we make too much of one little thing, and I I love the fact that you brought up the AT three Sagers um, in the Yom Kippur War. Um, wow, yeah, there you go. Because this question that we're asking today was uh, asked back in 1973 when the Israeli armor formations in the Sinai took a beating. It was a bloodbath. And everybody said, well, that's the end of Age of Tanks. In 1973, they said this. Well, what they found was that you could actually defeat these through different, just as we have seeds, which is a suppression of enemy air defense, we also have suppression of enemy anti-tank defense and artillery used in conjunction. So it's not just infantry, it's artillery and the infantry ride in the, in the, in the tracks, that is the you know, fighting vehicles. And we move forward with a barrage, whether it's you know aerial bombardment, close air support, artillery, or any combination thereof. And this keeps the enemy's heads down. It actually minimizes the effects of those um, bazookas. And then when you, you know, those anti-tank and anti-armor weapons, and then when that lets up, this is actually where the infantry come out. And let's be clear here that while the Americans are quite good at this, the Germans were the ones who pioneered it in World War II, uh, and the Russians and the Americans copied it and got quite good at it. And the Soviets were, frankly, at some point, arguably the best at this. Um, we are not seeing that play out in that, that level of aptitude. Uh, we're not seeing that play out in Ukraine, and there's a lot of good questions as to why. Is it the logistics? Is it the leadership? Is it the training? Is it Russia's effort to minimize uh, civilian combatant, de uh, non-combatant deaths? And my answer is, I don't know, but it, it could be any of those things. So we have to be careful. And I would say the fact that the Marines gave up their tanks, I disagree with it. But you know who, who doesn't have tanks? Air Force and Navy. So should, because the Army has tanks and the Air Force and Navy doesn't, maybe we should just give up ours? No. In fact, it was the Marines saying, stating clearly, the Army has so many and can come do that job when we need it to that we don't need it anymore. We don't need it any more than the Navy or the Air Force needs it, but the Army very much needs it. And so I, I want to point that out, that we make these sweeping generalizations off of just the most minutia of data, and we, we can quickly come to disastrous conclusions. The comment on the Marine Corps said exactly what you said, Don, that – when we need tanks, the army has tanks. <laughs> Dad, Doc, I couldn't agree more. I, I think it's a huge mistake. Um, you know, I, I just recently learned of this today, actually, that the Marine Corps was getting rid of their their tanks. You know, I understand the intention to focus on naval traditions, but um, you know, if you're attacking a beachhead and you actually gain a foothold, you're going to want to push past whatever defenses are there. You're going to need a tank to do it. Um, you know, the enemy has no doubt installed fortifications and possibly armor, depending on the conventionality of the foe, of course. Um, but I think it takes away from the overall capabilities of the Marine Corps. Uh, you know, the problem on relying on the Army is the difference of organizational cultures. The Army has historically been a little less aggressive than the Corps. No offense, Doc. But um, the ROEs in theater and the global war on terror were different for each branch. I can't tell you how many times the Army called on us when they saw a, a vehicle just sitting out in the middle of nowhere, thought it was a, a vehicle or a, an ID or something, and they would call the Marines to come shoot it up because we could. Um, that, that's just how we operate. There, there's a different focus there, a different uh, mentality there. Um, you know, there is a reason the Corps has its own air and land assets. Marines need to fight like Marines, and they need to fight with Marines. I was just watching a watching a story on one of those documentaries, and I forget what exactly what battle it was. It was a uh, this this British guy was in a Cromwell fighting against the Germans and, and knocked out a couple of German Panthers and a and a German half track in his Cromwell. But uh, part of the story was that we had we had an army unit, U.S. Army unit attached to this British armor, so it was a similar kind of thing where the Brits had the tanks and we had the infantry. And uh, we decided, hey, let's put these two together and we actually have a real military. And um, I know that a lot of the guys talked about before 
before the actual combat got heated, it was a lot of problems with who was in charge of what, uh, our way of doing things versus their way of doing things. And I'm sure that the differences between the U.S. Army and Marines may be more vast than the U.S. Army and the Brits. I don't know. I know there's certainly some, there's a lot of uh, chest thumping and pride going on there. So I imagine that we would experience those same growing pains too. But I guess the good news is, is that the reports typically were once combat got heated, a lot of those things went away and they did manage to operate as a fairly cohesive unit to get the job done. So, um, yeah, I mean, this my, you know, my, 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 my comment on the whole Marines getting rid of tanks thing, I definitely can see why they're doing it for all the points that Brent pointed out. And, and I think more, uh, also, just looking at the, the real job of Marines, I think that you, you need to go back and revisit that every so often because it kind of seems like a lot of times Marines try to look more and more like the Army, and then they, they do a revamp at some point, and they, they kind of get, get back to their roots, and I think that's a good thing uh, because I do think that they're a little bit more of a um, – shouldn't be necessarily a jack-of-all-trades, but should have a little bit more of a specific – uh, use uh, maybe more so than the general army is and they're a smaller unit too as a whole just just by the numbers so i think that's i think that's a good thing but yeah uh i just, i still i still think that just the the introduction of these man portable extremely inexpensive relatively speaking uh any tank weapons and and like uh like doc said the the panzerfaust which was introduced in 1943 by the germans if I had to produce this today, I could produce this today with my limited knowledge. And if I had to produce this today and go to a machine shop, I could probably build one for under a thousand U.S. dollars. The U.S. military could probably produce one for about two hundred dollars if they were mass producing them. And they're absolutely as capable today as they were at the time of taking out light armored vehicles. Now, using one of those to take out a, a heavy tank. Probably not. Their armors become much better, especially with reactive armor. But the point being is that even things like in-laws and even, even advanced systems like javelins, compared to the cost of a main battle tank, what is it? What does a base M1 Abrams go for? What does a base T-72 go for? If you went out on the open market today and you called up Nicolas Cage and you said, hey, I need three T-72s tomorrow, what's he going to charge you for those T-72s on the open market? Compared yeah. to getting your hands on three javelins or in-laws or or, or or any man portable weapon system capable of taking out that same tank. I think that the, the cost analysis is fairly tremendous. And artillery is great for taking out, again, you know, fixed positions where you're like, hey, we know there are people here. We've got a grid. We can wipe them out, whether it's vehicles or infantry. But when you've got a small squad and that squad's moving around and that squad has got a couple of javelins like a Marine unit would have become much more difficult to pin down. They can hit a couple of vehicles and fall back. And I don't think we can really, I mean, well, I think we're sort of talking about two different things here. We're talking about on the one hand, the ideal U S military philosophy of an attack. And that is vastly different from what we're seeing on the battlefield in Ukraine, where I think that we can all agree that the Russians certainly aren't following that. That they're, they're sending tanks, they're sending tanks ahead without infantry support. And if you don't clear buildings, villages, and trench lines uh, to the flanks of the tanks, they become extremely vulnerable to these inexpensive type weapons. Go ahead, Doc. Yeah, okay. So answers. It's about 500,000, half a million for T-72. Uh, uh, T-90, I think, is 3 million. Uh, a T, the arm, Armada is supposed to be uh, 4.8 million and an M1 Abrams fully loaded with the latest, greatest thing is about 6 million. All right. And, and it's a great argument. Hey, a $50,000 Javelin versus a $6 million tank or even a, even a half million dollar tank, right? Versus a $50,000 missile. And we can say the same thing. I mean, you've got, uh, you know, you've got, God, what are we paying for the F-22? And it can be taken out by a, you know, by a hundred thousand dollar shoulder fired rocket. And it's, what is it? I don't know, 120 million each, some ridiculous number, you know, and, and B-1 bombers and B-2 bombers and everything else. And it's, so this is like, this is a, an interestingly, um, 
isolated and narrow view that, that this topic is, is that there, there are countermeasures to tanks. Therefore, and there has been again since I would argue 1941, um, and there are countermeasures against tanks, some more effective than others, so we should give up tanks. I'm not ready to give up our B-2 bomber. I'm not ready to give up our F-16. I'm not ready to give up our F-22. I'm not ready to give up our UH-60 Blackhawk, in spite of the fact that there are countermeasures for each one of them. The other thing I wish that people would see, and I know I don't, I don't get angry at them because they've never been on the receiving end of it. I wish that they would see, uh, you know, just experience once what 3,500 man armored brigade feels like coming at you. And, and, and not with real bullets. Let's just do it with blanks and miles gear. Because you go to, you know, you go to NTC out there and you have a, you know, 1,200 guys in defense with tanks and artillery and you've got jets flying overhead and uh, helicopters duking it out. And you're sitting there watching, you 1,200 are watching 3,500 men advancing to you. And you can see them in the desert so far out that I'm not joking. We have guys laying on sandbags. All our fighting positions are already dug. We have guys taking their shirts, taking their minds off, getting a suntan while waiting for them to come because it takes that long, right? And then when they finally come in, oh, air battles won. Who won? Who lost? Who's going to get hit by the close air support? You know, oh, artillery's coming in. Now they're simulating that. Holy crap. Uh, they're 3,500 meters out because main battle tanks are now firing at us. And when you see this, and you stand up there with your javelin, you feel like you're standing on a mountain in Colorado watching a raging forest fire pull oxygen out of towns and kill people, and you're about to whip your penis out and take a piss on that fire. That's what you feel like. And you're like, hmm. And you're watching it, and you're watching it. You're watching you know, the rockets fire from other positions because there's 1,200 of you there. You know, and you're watching this and you're watching our own tanks take out tanks and you're seeing those tanks die out in front of you. You know, they're light up. They have to stop. People get out. Oh, we're all dead. And you're watching just, wow, there's 80, 100, 120, 140, 160 are now dead, blinking in front of you. And here comes another 100. And here comes another 100. And the artillery's coming in and jets are strafing you. And you're like, Jesus, mother of God. I crawl underneath my overhead cover 18 inches deep, slide in the back and just sit there and wait for it all to end. I'm like, wait, when the infantry get here, I'll have a fighting chance of maybe surviving this mayhem. And if you've never experienced that, then having a javelin and watching YouTube really does this. I know it sounds like I'm being condescending. I'm trying to say I get it. I understand it. It looks like you're hooking and jabbing. And like, whoop, we found him. Voomp. No, what you found was the one guy whose track came off. They put the track on and the 120 vehicles in their battalion is already gone. And they're driving through, did a left when they should have gone right, found a small village and went, hey, here's a bunch of people. I hope they're friendly. What? Oh my God, an in-law. You know, I, I'm like... Now we have to, we have to, that's my last point on this is take what you see with a grain of salt. Yes, you are seeing tanks. I'm not saying it's a lie. Oh, he's saying the tanks aren't actually being destroyed. No, they're being destroyed right in front of your eyes. Um, how much damage how, are they put back into the fight? You know, five days later, maybe. Were they totaled? Maybe. Um, but here's the point. You're watching this and you're saying, man, I just watched six different, ep you know, live leak episodes and I counted 14 tanks and tracks all blown up. Yeah, that's great. How many thousand do they have there? I've, I've lost count. Is it 5,000 now? 6,000? 10,000? 12,000? God knows. They're like, we've killed a thousand tanks. whoop de do. I mean, how many days, you know, it, did that mean of warfare in World War II? How many days of that? You know, it's just not that big of a deal. And so what I'm trying to say is Ukraine has tanks and tank formations. Ukraine has BMPs and BMP formations. Where are they? You're not seeing it and I'm not seeing it. And my question is, are they all dead 
or are they in reserves or are they duking it out? You're only seeing what one side wants to show you. Take it all with a grain of salt, brothers. Take it all with a grain of salt. We'll see in eight years from now what the actual counts were because you're not going to find that this year. That data won't be out in 2022. Well, I also wonder where they are. Um, and I don't have an answer to that question either. But um, I think what, what I do know is that they aren't being used against other tank units. So they've either been used up or they're being, they're being held in reserve. And if, and I, I, cause I'm going to tell you that those Azov guys, which have now been rolled into the um, Ukrainian national guard, but uh, they love video and everything that they had. They love putting it out there. If you look up their channel on YouTube, it's actually a fantastic channel. Everybody's got 4k footage and it's very, just pump you up. It just they did a good job with it. Um, the fact that that information is not being put out there at all, tells me that they're, they're not being used for one reason or another. But what we do know are being used are these man portable rocket launchers. And we do know that those are taking out tanks left and right. And I would say by the hundreds, maybe more. And you're right. I'm not saying that Russia is going to exhaust their ammo supply on uh, uh, moving into Ukraine uh, or the armor supply moving into Ukraine. That's certainly not the case. But that might not necessarily need to be the case, because if they start realizing that their tanks are essentially the way they're being used, ineffective and a, a huge waste of material, then they will have to either change tactics or at least stop using that tactic and maybe stop using that armor. So I think that, you know, the, the whole Ukraine situation is unique, but isn't, isn't every war, right? Isn't every war unique? I mean, well, I think, I think back to, like you said, the big battles of world war II, Kursk, for example, where Germany won Kursk, but Germany's losses were so great, not as great as the Russians, but Germany couldn't hold those up, couldn't sustain those losses. And they learned at that point, Going tank on tank is too expensive for us to do because even if our Panther can take out five T-34s, it's not a high enough kill ratio. We can't ask any more out of the crew. They're doing everything that they could possibly do. We're pushing the limits of our technology, but it's still not enough. Mm -hmm. And um, you move things in like, you know, again, you start to see those somewhat being supplemented and then replaced with Panzer Faust and later Panzer Shreks and, what eventually became the RPG series, um, whoo, man, those things are, are devastating against everything. And when one guy can carry it around, you carry around an RPG with three rockets on your back and an AK as a single individual, uh, pretty much so anything you come up against, you have the capability of defeating. Now, whether you, you do it or not, that's up to you. But that's tactics. That's tactics and, yeah. and a bit of luck. But, yeah. Compared, yeah. but compared, compared to the, the cost benefit, of your life, which is in, which has no value in Ukraine or, or in, or in Russia for a military, right? An individual soldier. Um, and the cost of those systems that are on your back versus the cost of a tank with a five man crew, or even a truck loaded down with troops or a BMP loaded down of troops. Um, I, I just think that, I think that this, there, there's some, there's big, big heads in the military looking at cost benefit analysis, right? And they're realizing that, Hey, Using these man portable launchers may be the way to go rather than for, do, trying to do tank on tank, especially where you're not always guaranteed a tank on tank battle. Okay, but hold on. So I watched this uh, dark comedy years and years ago. I don't even remember the name of it, but I thought it was funny because it was all about weapons sales, right? And so there was a fictional Central African country and, and here's the weapons sales guy, you know, like the God of War sort of thing, but it's a comedy. And he's saying, uh, he's saying, yeah, we sold... F-16s to both sides. And somebody stops and he says, wait a minute, we sold F-16s in you know, this fictional country, country. He goes, oh yeah, and there's civil war. And he's like, well, which side had pilots? And they said, oh, neither. Neither side had pilots. Uh, they got them on tall hills and um, with roads and they would roll them down at each other <laughs> and smash them in. And of course it's comedy, but it brings up the point that just because your tactics are comically bad doesn't mean that the F-16 isn't viable. Just because your tactics with your you know, armored formations are just horrible doesn't mean that the Germans 
the British, the South Koreans, the Indians. It doesn't mean that they're going to use the Israelis, the South Africans. They've used their tanks with amazing outcomes. Even in places that tanks don't fare too well in some cases, such as mountains and uh, cities. I'll also point out that while Vietnam, my, my dad always pointed this out, that while Vietnam was an infantryman's fight, there was air war, there were tank wars and, and artillery wars and all involved. It was a combined arms, but it was by and large an infantryman's fight because of the jungle warfare and the mountains. Still, in order to take Vietnam in South Vietnam in 1975, the North Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese came in with armored formations. And that's how they won against the South Vietnamese Arvin. So while I will, now if we want to get into it, we certainly can. We can say tanks in steep mountains, not so good. Light infantry going to win nine times out of 10. I'm going to agree with that. And I've seen that. That's my experience and training and all this other stuff, right? So I'm going, yep, 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 yep. Tanks in jungles, not so good. Light infantry going to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tanks in cities, it's a crapshoot. What's our rule of engagement? Because if it's a Fallujah kind of moment, holy crap. The Israelis and, you know, and the army and the Marines and the Brits there in Fallujah and the Israelis many times in Gaza have shown, eh, if we take the gloves off and open up the rules of engagement, tanks do a really good, you know? Um, so they're wonderful to have on your side if you take the gloves off. If you don't, they're coffins. And just, just as they are in the jungle and just as they are often in the mountains, tanks can quickly become very expensive coffins. You put tanks in open space... No. The only way light infantry are going to win is if you have an incompetent, an incompetent uh, military that you're fighting against. Again, think think of uh, you know the fictional Africans pushing the F-16s down the highway at each other. That's that's the only way you're going to win. Are the Russians incompetent? That is what Live Leak and YouTube are telling us. Is that true? Yeah, Doc, you mentioned open space. That's a brilliant point. You know. Desert Storm, Battle of 73 Easting. Uh, I don't think a lot of man portable weapons would have been effective against eight Iraqi tank divisions. Um, that's That was a tank-on-tank -tank battle. It wasn't too long ago. Um, that could be around the corner as well. Uh, gentlemen, what I think this boils down to is what is the next war for America? Is it with Russia? Is it with Iran? Hell, is it with Mexico? We don't know. All we can do is plan according to where the political strife is right now. And right now it's with China. Uh, you know, we do have North Korea, Iran, and Russia to worry about. But, uh, you know, my, now my question is, you know, are, are we, and Brent, you can you can chime in on this, are, are we kind of shifting the Marine Corps into a specific role for, say, something like counterinsurgency and leaving the Army for conventional operations? Um, if that's the case, yeah, maybe the Marine Corps doesn't need tanks. Um, but if we're talking a, a peer or near-peer war, we're going to need tanks. We're going to need a lot of tanks. So the, the China is, without a question, the number one threat, at least according to the, the Marine Corps. And that there's no question. That is what everything we're doing, the, the, the service-wide, is being revamped specifically for China. Now, does that mean that China war is going to happen? We don't know that. I mean, if you would ask the United States, you know, any Marine in the United States Marine Corps prior to 9-11 – who the next war was going to be with. They probably would have told you freaking uh, North Korea or Iran or something, right? No one would have ever expected that we were going to be locked in two decades of counterinsurgency in the Middle East. Uh, but right now, China is the number one threat that we're gearing up for. So the Marine Corps is looking at how are we going to fight? You know, they're looking at little islands. They're looking at littoral concepts. You know, Marines facilitating the, the U.S. Navy being able to whoop the shit out of the PLAN. And uh, in that strategy, the the tank again. It's not that the Marine Corps doesn't want tanks. It's just that funds are only so so much, right? And we're one of the smallest branches of the armed forces. They can't pay for these new high speed badass Marine Corps anti ship missiles to be launched from the shores, and still pay for you know the latest and greatest M1 upgrade. So it's just a it's a give or take, and the, you know, and the commandant. My understanding is the commandant's like, hey, we can't 
we can't get this stuff with the some of these older legacy device uh systems so we're gonna have to divest of these older legacy systems not that they're not effective but we have to get rid of those in order to pay for this uh so that's what they're looking at um and i'm, I'm not gonna say i, I 100 agree with it or not i'm still up in the air because i as a young infantryman know <laughs> i've seen how effective tanks are in combat and I also know what the mental mind fuck is to the infantrymen being on the other side of the tank. How do I know that? Well, I was in the back of an AAV when I heard the AV crewman in the turrets yell enemy armor in the tree line. And my fucking butthole was about this tight. And that ramp dropped for us to dismount. And I know the feeling of going up against enemy armor. So <laughs> there's a psychological factor associated with fighting against tanks. And, uh, you know, there's the actual, you know, firepower associated with those. It, I mean, who knows? Our, we're, we're planning on fighting the Chinese, but we're, we could be fighting off some far off country that nobody's fucking heard of again, you know, for another 20 years. You know, completely different than what we originally thought. So time will tell. I've seen in the comments and we've already mentioned it. It's just a pendulum, right? You know, tanks have been around for a long time. They're an effective weapon system, still are, whether they're manned by human beings or are we fast forward to the future and they're manned by freaking robots or some 18-year-old with a PlayStation controller. Uh, <laughs> they're going to be around for a long time. And, you know where I thought when you said robots, you know where I thought you were headed. But all right. Um, anyway. Uh, <laughs> right there. <laughs> There's the tank crew. I'll join the tank that's crew. A, that's a four-man four crew right there, or woman. I don't know. I'm not a biologist. 2050 tank crew right there. There you go. Um. So, all right. So, a couple of things. First off, uh, to the guy who called me a boomer in the comments. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I'm not offended. That's my dad's generation. I not. I wasn't born during that time. But, uh, but I do still say live leak the same way. When I say live leak, I mean social media video based. Can I just say live leak? Uh, YouTube, I tend to mean YouTube, but I say live leak. I say Velcro. I say whiteboard. I say Band-Aid. Um, you know. It, okay. it is funny how these kids don't know what the term boomer means, yet they use it all the yeah. time. Well, I, 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 get called, I get called that too, and I'm like, I, that, that's not what year I was born. Like, like words have meaning and there's, there's a history to that. It's like, no, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a child conceived after World War II when my grandfather got back uh, from, <laughs> from being wounded in Normandy. But you know, these, these young whippersnappers, they think that they're, they think that they're coming at us and, and, and we're the old man just sitting back laughing going, man, this generation's dumb as fuck. Well, you know, I mean, why not? I mean, go ahead and count me in the greatest generation. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm cool with that. Uh, if, if they're good generations. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, I, I think it's, look, if we can, if you don't mind, Brent, because it keeps coming up, why did the Marines get rid of tanks? And it is tangentially related to the discussion at hand. And so I heard some, you know, 10 pound head, uh, Dr. Humpty Frump speaking probably around 2008. He was making the rounds. And I, and I say that, I just can't remember his name. Uh, the guy was making a whole lot of sense. And he talked specifically, I think he was State Department. Okay, this is what really made it interesting. But he was like some liaison to DOD. And he talked about, you know, the interwar years between World War I and World War II, where Marines were trying to redefine themselves. They redefined themselves for World War II as island hoppers. And how this happens every generation or so, the Marines have to come back and say, wait, but we're not the Army. And, and that's not necessarily bad because, if it, again, like you always say, if it adds to our combat capabilities, that's great. Let's do it. So this guy back in, uh, you know, uh, 10 to 15 years ago, he was making the rounds and he was saying, look, what here's what happens. The Marines need to become a de facto State Department military. Now, he wasn't serious. It would still be DOD. But he was saying the Navy and the Marines are expeditionary in nature where the Army and the Air Force uh, are warfighters in nature, like when we commit to total war and all this other stuff, right? And so um, so there are cultural differences that uh, Chad brought up, um, and we could go into that if we really want to get you know into ad nauseum. But, um, but it's okay that the Marines want to redefine themselves. It's okay that this guy was walking around saying, here's what I want. He said, I want a Marine Corps, and he seems to be getting his way, is why I mentioned this. He said, I want a Marine Corps that's lighter and 
you know, and, and just as mean as it is, but it's lighter. It doesn't have all of the accoutrements of the Army Brigade or Division or Corps. We'll bring them later. But he's like, what I want is, and you're saying counterinsurgency, that's only one of a rainbow, uh, you know, a spectrum of operations that he was suggesting they use. Like, can they do peacekeeping? Can they do peace enforcement? Can they do show of force? Um, can they do, you know, um, invasion? That is, uh, what's it? gaining access, gaining access to shores, gaining access to ports. Um, they can do all of these things, basically to hold a dagger at the throat of our antagonists. And, uh, you know, and what would happen would be the American diplomacy would have the Navy and um, the Marines, mostly the Marines, at their beck and call. And this is what he was saying. He was like, give me a bunch of Marines and I'll put them in a box and I'll shake them up and get them real angry and then like take the lid off and throw them at the bad guys. Um, and that makes sense. However, realize when he was speaking, 10 to 15 years ago, we were still embroiled in Iraq and Afghanistan. We were still fighting the global war, war on terror. And so there's part of me even back then that thought, huh, you know, I appreciate the Marines defining what they bring to the fight because they bring many valuable things. And I understand we're fighting a global war on terror. So this guy's plan makes a lot of sense. But when China is your greatest threat and you're looking at peer warfare, potentially total warfare, do you really want to leave the Marines without all the crayons in the box, so to speak? Yeah, I, I agree. The time to get rid of the tanks was during the global war on terror. If you wanted to get rid of tanks now, I not so much. Um, if China is our threat, you know, let, 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 let's look at that. Let's prepare for that. You know, the army's obviously preparing for that with their new operations manual that was released a couple of years ago. Um, they're convert. They're moving more towards conventional operations. It's obvious the Marine Corps is doing it. Why not go that route? As Doc already pointed out, the, the Marine Corps is is kind of coming to that crossroads. We we cross it essentially after every single major war, and it's we have to we have to stay viable, right? Because what's going to happen is when you roll into peacetime, you're going to have politicians in the background saying. Why do we have a Marine Corps? Why can't the Army do what the Marines do? So the Marine Corps has to, you know, again, after every major war, we did it after World War II and, you know, after Korea and Vietnam and everything else. And we have to say we have to prove that we're still viable, that the Army cannot do what we we can do. And one of the ways to do that is getting back in bed with the Navy. All right. And tying ourselves with the Navy, because what happened in Iraq is, well, we just proved that. We just were a second land force. We were doing what the army does <laughs> the whole time. The whole time we were doing it better, but uh... well, yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, but essentially, the whole time we were in Iraq and Afghanistan, we were doing the exact same thing that the army does. Uh, so now we have to get back in bed with the navy and say, <laughs> "Hey, motherfuckers! Like we're naval infantry. Uh, we have to get back with you to maintain our viable status." OK, so that, you know, politicians in the rear don't look at us and say, oh, let's cut the Marine Corps that, so that we can fund, you know, global sex change surgeries for every American across the country. So uh, I want to sh show something real quick. So this is uh, a well deck of an LPD. All right. Those are those are Amtrak. Those are not tanks. However, they are very similar in size to an M1 Abrams. And you can see that. They take up a lot of space on ship, all right? And that's in the, again, that's in the well deck of an LPD. Now, obviously, there's no talk of getting rid of uh, AAVs. Those particular AAVs, yes, we're going to replace them with a different style or a different vari variant. Um, but you can see just how much space. Now, imagine, you know, trying to fit tanks in there when you need to fit other stuff. What other assets? Especially if you're talking an island hopping campaign where these Marines are going to be facing threats of being cut off from their supply lines, right? You know, in a, a, a fight against a pure threat like China, there's no guarantee that chow and fuel and all this stuff is going to come in and be able to make it to reinforce and resupply those Marines that are on these individual islands and these island chains, you know, defending against Chinese Navy assets. Um, they might have to be self-resourceful. Self 
And I saw a uh, an interview with the Commandant of the Marine Corps where he said, hey, Marines are going to start need to learn how to forge, you know, because <laughs> there's no guarantee that our supply lines are going to be able to, you know, withstand, uh, you know, a, a war with China. They, it, they're going to be threatened for sure, 100%. So I see where the Marine Corps is going. Again, I don't necessarily agree that we should have divested, at least with all of our tanks. Um, but when the when you look at the cost versus, you know, benefit, I, I see where they're going with this. So I see the bigger picture. Yeah. Hey, Brent, there's a couple of comments while you're talking relevant to what you're saying. So uh, Douchebag's brother, he said something to the effect of that, you know, uh, armored formations are still going to be very viable, as particularly when you have air superiority, right? And so I think that this is a point that is getting lost in the sauce here, uh, you know, in, in the social media and news media, is that um, part of the success for the Ukrainian and part of the failure for the Russians has nothing to do with tanks. In fact, it has very little to do with shoulder fire rockets. It has to do with the fact that drones are so prolific and there are very few countermeasures today, not zero, um, but countermeasures will become more prolific because of this war, okay? And those drones are able to call in artillery, close air support, and they're able to call in javelins and in-laws and RPG-7s, and they're able to call this in. So I, I think that once you start to see countermeasures, and this is where we started, I think, in fact, Brent, you started this conversation by saying, look, eventually countermeasures to drones and our, and shoulder fire rockets are countermeasures to the tank. And this is that pendulum we keep talking about. Now there will be countermeasures to the countermeasures. And we're going to see that. And I do believe that air dominance and air superiority will play major roles in the longevity of the relevance of the tank. I'll also say that the relevance of the Marine Corps, somebody else made a comment while you're talking there, and he said something to the effect of, yeah, if we go to war, I'm badly paraphrasing the poor guy. He said, if we go to war with China, we'll need 100,000 paratroopers. Well, that's just the point. We don't have 100,000 paratroopers. We have the 82nd Airborne at about 12,000 troops, and we have the 173rd Brigade at about 3,500 troops. You add those together, you're a little over 15,000 troops of airborne. Now we have the air assault, but air assault's a different vehicle and they can be shot down and they're more vulnerable in um, long range, you know, deep into the enemy territory. They uh, show all sorts of vulnerabilities. What you're talking about is fast moving planes that go, hey, you guys, I don't like you anymore. Get out of the airplane. And then you drop a whole bunch of paratroopers there. And you're like, yeah, we're going to drop a hundred thousand. We don't have a hundred thousand. And that's why we need Marines because someone's got to take that beachhead. And, uh, you know, the paratroopers are relevant. And we had this conversation back in the 19, uh, 1988. I'm sitting around with uh, special forces from the 10th Mountain over beers, and we're debating whether airborne was relevant at the time. And I actually, being a young man, and, you know, I took the position that airborne formations were no longer relevant. I've backtread, backpedaled on that. I, I think I was caught up in many of the things that we see people today caught up and say, well, I'm looking at a narrow set of data, a narrow set of historical perspective, and therefore huge formations of paratroopers are outdated and obsolete. Eh, eh, maybe not so much. Uh, maybe they still are very, very relevant. And so same same thing with tanks, same thing with Marines. But yeah, taking that uh, taking that fight and seizing the, the beachhead, Brent, is important. The question then is, because you're going, well, then we drop the, the Airborne. We drop the 82nd Airborne and we save the Marines. And the Airborne isn't real good at fighting off tank battles. And they learned that in World War II um, at, to their own dismay. Uh, it was a bloodbath. So I, I guess this is the point, once again, I, I've... I've been light infantry. I've been air assault infantry. I've fought against even third grade nasty ass mech units that handed us our ass in, under circum circum circumstances. And when we got into a terrain that they should not have been and they tried to chase us, we handed them their ass. But, you know, so this, this is that pendulum again. Who does what? And it's a combined arms fight. It's a joint fight, meaning every service has a role. Um, 
And yeah, hey, you know what? I'll go ahead and say one more thing, Brent, because you were talking about our logistics on the back. So this is what they, this is the frustration. If you look at the army divisions and a division guys is 10, 12,000 people. And you see these fights in island hopping during World War II, where you'd have two Marine and one or two army divisions. So let's say you got four divisions and half of them are army. And the Marines were pushing so hard. Now they took way higher casualties, but they were pushing so hard. And the army is like going, whoa, what are you guys doing? And the Navy and the Marine were getting very, very frustrated with the army commanders because the army's like, look, I'm not going to take the, those kind of casualties. I can achieve this mission and get it done instead of one week, I'll get it done in four weeks and I'll do it with half the casualties. And this made sense in army thinking because army isn't thinking, hey dude, psst, all of your supply and logistics are on the ship sitting in the water behind you. And if the kamikazes make that move, you're cut off. See, this isn't army thinking, that's marine thinking but it shows you the culture, why there are cultural differences, why the Marines in the Pacific were so damn hostile and so aggressive and the army's going, so what if it takes us three months to do this? So we get it done. Because they didn't understand naval logistics. We're too used to army and air force logistics. The Marine Corps learned that lesson at Guadalcanal when the Navy <laughs> left. They had to leave and, and the Marines were on their own. Yeah, I just wanted to point out one quick thing. Uh, if if tanks were not important, why is the president of Ukraine calling for tanks? <laughs> Brent, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I don't know if you guys heard this story. Um, this just broke recently, but it looks like Poland is looking. This sounds like a, 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 another page from the same chapter with the uh, – the, uh, aircraft fiasco but looks like poland is looking at giving a bunch of tanks to ukraine we've green lighted it we've said we'll backfill it with m1 abrams and ukraine is saying yes we absolutely will take those tanks we'd love to have them i also have seen a couple of different retired military generals u.s military generals that have said a very similar thing they've said look we have 3500 tanks in reserve in the u.s give them 500 of them why not? We can afford to do it. It wouldn't mean anything to us, and it would mean a lot to them. So there are obviously uh, big people with a lot more experience in these things than I will ever have that are saying that tanks are still viable, Ukraine wants them, and Ukraine needs them. So I, I thought I would point that out. I don't know if this is going to end up being the same kind of fiasco where Poland is going to want to drive them to Germany before they drive them back to Ukraine. And let's hope that's not the case. But it is a current story that broke about, I think, two or three days ago. Hey, Bruce, Bruce, can I interrupt you? Have you seen that story? I think I saw it yesterday where Germany is talking. I'm going, where is Germany? Get this. Germany is talking about giving Ukraine a, a thousand BMPs. BMPs, Russian made BMPs. I don't know where in sure. God's green earth. Where, where, well, they probably had them sitting around. You know, they're probably sitting in warehouses from East Germany, yeah. and they got little communist flags painted on them. And Germany uh -huh. just mothballed those things. And they're like, "Look, we need the warehouse space. Let's get rid of them. They're they're bad on greenhouse gases. So uh, well, all the people will vote to send them to Ukraine. That wouldn't surprise me one bit." I forgot about that. You're absolutely. I was sitting there going, "Where in the world did the Bundeswehr come up with a thousand BMPs?" Ah, uh, East Germany. Okay. Eh, just call me a boomer. Well, you being a boomer, should be, East Germany should be on the forefront of your mind. I know. That was your era, Doc. <laughs> That's what I meant. I meant I fought them all. <laughs> three against a thousand. It was the toughest three we ever fought. Anyway. Hey, I want to address a comment real quick here from Red Dawn 1984. Who stated, should the USMC look into light medium tank concept? That's a good idea. That's kind of a happy medium between the two points of view here. Um, if they can't support an Abrams, maybe something lighter might be good. But like I said before, you take that beachhead, you're going to want to push interior past the beachhead. You're probably going to want to tank. So uh, maybe that's a good concept. I know the Army's looking at it. I got an article up right now from Army Times. Um the army is looking at looking at uh, going to a light tank battalion concept. So 
you know, it might not be bad for the Marine Corps just to, you know, instead of getting rid of their tanks, maybe turn to something cheaper. And it, it a makes good idea. sense too. Makes sense, Chad. When you when you say light, I know that that you don't necessarily mean by weight, but that was the first thing that came to my mind when Brent posted that picture of all of those amphibious vehicles lined up inside a ship. And he said, hey, they're about the same size as an M1 Abrams. They have about the same footprint. Yeah, but I bet they weigh a whole lot less. I don't know this, but I'm betting that they do. And you put 20 M1 Abrams in a ship versus 20 of a lighter, uh, less armored, uh, amphibious capable vehicle. I imagine the weight dis, uh, the weight difference is rather substantial. About a third less, or two thirds less. Uh, most APCs are roughly one third the weight of a uh, main battle tank. Sometimes a quarter, uh, but you know it, it it varies. But yeah, about a third less weight. Even if it's not, you know, uh, amphibious have to float and they have to carry a whole lot of people. And so they're much bigger than most APCs, armored personnel carriers, infantry fighting vehicles, all of these things. So they tend to be much bigger. Um, yeah, M1, I think fully loaded is, is definitely north of 60, uh, uh, 60 times. And that's think- nothing, nothing new for the Marines. I mean, ever since, ever since there was armored warfare, well, we'll say World War II, the Marines have used amphibious vehicles to, to unload from ships, move up to shore, and then basically transition from, from a type of, of, of APC carrying troops safely onto a shore to a pseudo tank pushing inland. They did this in Vietnam on occasion as well. So there's there's not really anything new there. It's, there's certainly a, a need for that type of role. And that's one of those very specific roles that I think the Marines can play where um, I, I completely see their, their need in a vehicle like that. Yeah, I tell you what, this is a really exciting topic because, and it's very timely. And and the the thing is that I was perplexed at watching the Army discuss a light tank. The Army hasn't had a light tank since the M41 Walker Bulldog of Korea. And it fared so badly against the T-34 that the Army kind of just rode off light tanks in the 1950s, right? And so they haven't had it even though light tanks have fared in, well in other wars, I think the uh, uh, the Ogden War, you know, the initial, um, some fights there in uh, Taiwan and, and other places. The point is they fared well in certain wars and, and in certain battles. And this makes a lot of sense. Look, Gallipoli showed that when you seize a beachhead and don't move inland, as Chad is saying, if you don't move inland, they just circle you and your beachhead is for naught and then a Gallipoli falls out. Hey, there, there she goes. Um, so your M41, uh, and, yep. And there's the 551 Sheridan. You're right. The 551 Sheridan is definitely a light tank. I forgot that one. It is a airborne droppable light tank, but we haven't used it in a long time, right? Let's, let's be honest. And Probably so, not since Vietnam. Right. So the thing about light tanks is they have their role and airborne operations is one of those, but beachhead operations are one of those. And Generally speaking, the Army has no business playing with them unless we're talking, you know, like I said, a deep strike airborne, something like that, because it gives your ground pounders, your dismounted light infantry airborne guys some, you know, there's the 551. It gives them some firepower and some maneuverability to strike. And the funny thing is they don't range out. They don't range out in front of that infantry. Those 551s are not that thick. Neither was that M41 Walker Bulldog. And so uh, when it went out against North Koreans, they often didn't come back. They just turned into flames. So they have to be protected by the infantry. And so this is a very, very specialized tank, guys. It's not an MBT. It's not a main battle tank, which is the default of the Army's position and should be, as we've learned through other battles. But the Marines, of all people, really would benefit. As we said, they seize that beachhead. And then they have to punch in deeper so they don't get cut off. Hmm, light tanks would would be the the thing to bring. That might be the the medium ground. One of the one of the really cool things about the Sheridan, just a little fun fact from Bruce, is that that was a nuclear capable tank as well. It could fire um, a ballistic uh, nuclear weapon, a small one, obviously. Uh, there's lots of video and photos of it. I actually worked with a guy who was a Sheridan crewman. And he almost 
got to do that one time. And that was, that's his claim to fame in his military. It was like, oh, I was one of the few candidates. I almost, almost was on a crew that got to test fire one of those and he didn't get to, but he almost got to. But uh, I think that, I mean, I don't know. That's a neat little capability. Like you said, um, that is a, that is sort of a, a niche weapon, but something light that's air droppable and could easily be loaded onto ships um, that might not necessarily need a lot of armor because it may not come up against a, a main battle tank would be, um, be certainly certainly awesome. Speaking of main battle tanks, there's less. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we're in a, a Zoom conference call now. <laughs> I had to go to the backup to the back of a backup computers. <laughs> well, I don't know if you've been privy to our conversation, man. Have you been listening? Uh, off and on. Well, basically okay, well, what's been going on, Les, is me and Doc have been talking about what the Marines should be doing, and uh, Chad and uh, Brand have been fairly silent. <laughs> well, this is easy. When we're talking tanks and Marines, there's only one tank the Marines should ever have been using, and that's the Merkava from Israel. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Absolutely. The Merkava. Why is that? Because it can carry troops? Well, that's one reason. And borders. But the um, Marine Corps has the exact same problem the Israelis have. The most valuable part of the tank to the Israelis is the crew. And the Merkava is designed to have modular armor, the engines up front to protect the crew. And the Merkava is not really designed to carry troops. It's designed to carry an extra crew. So one tank gets knocked out, another Merkava can pull up beside it and take on that crew and get it back to safety. It's got heavy armor. It's got a big gun. If we're island hopping in the Marines, the tank doesn't need the speed of an M1. It could have M4 Sherman speed, and it would be just adequate. Um, it needs a powerful gun. It needs a lot of armor, so it can make its way up the beach with lines of Marines behind it, hiding behind that armor and fanning out when the opportunity presents itself. I don't know. You know, you know tank for the Marine Corps. I don't know if I can agree with that. The Israelis specifically made it, or at least this is what they've claimed all along, is when people go, how come you made a tank that weighs more than a battleship? Um, their answer is, well, we never intended a battleship to carry it. We thought if anybody carried anybody, we'd just park the battleship on the Merkava and we would uh, take it across country that way. Uh, the, 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 I don't know that these are very deployable. And, and that's what the, and the Israelis, yeah, well, the Israelis, to their, I mean, to their credit, they said, well, who was ever going to deploy them? We're, we're a self-defense uh, military, defense force. Uh, we're never going to deploy these things. They're, and they said they're not appropriate for the United States of America running all over God's green earth and fighting the, you know, the penguins in Madagascar. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if I agree with that. We're, we're talking, we're going the other direction. You know, at least, I don't know if Chad and Brent agree, but at least Bruce and I have decided that the Marines need to buy light tanks Um and, okay, Chad agrees with that, that they need light tanks because when they take that beachhead, they need to secure deeper inland and then wait for the army to pull up with its great big ships and, you know, jump in their paratroopers and do all that stuff. But the army is the one that needs to bring in the heavy tanks. Um, but instead of giving up all of their tanks, it seems to me the Marines might have gone to a light tank that, again... Other than the M551 uh, uh, Sheridan and its Shillelagh missile, that's the name of that missile, um, Bruce. At least I believe it is. Yeah, you're right. That thing's garbage. Yeah, well, um, okay. But it's the, it's the only modern light tank after the M41 Walker Bulldog was deployed in Korea to, I mean, you know, it certainly had its heyday. Uh, the Walker Bulldog was a good tank but it was a light tank. It just didn't fare well against a T-34. Fared perfectly fine against the North Koreans and the Chinese, but not so well against their tanks. Um, anyway, that's where we are. We, you know, we're kind of thinking light tank and you're going tank. No, nah, just pull the battleship up. Just put, well, here, let me, let me put on my logisticians hat. You know, one of the reasons the Marine Corps is getting rid of the uh, tank, which I don't want the tanks to go away, but I understand the decision. Back when I was in in the 80s and stuff, an amphibious battle group consisted of a minimum of four ships, usually five. Um, now, uh, an amphibious ready group is three ships. The Marine Corps cannot afford the logistics footprint of the M1 for two reasons. One, it's not just the tank, it's everything that goes with it. And 
as far as tanks go, M1s are gas hogs. The M60 was not. Not only that, the M1 takes a lot bigger footprint on the boat than the M60 did. It's harder to maneuver around the boat if your mission doesn't require tanks first. And all the other supplies, 120 millimeter ammunition is a whole lot more bulky than um, 105 ammunition. And on top of it, all the spares from the M1 are incredibly bulky compared to other tanks. So its logistic footprint is way too big. The Merkava, on the other hand, is a fairly self-contained tank. Still runs a 105 millimeter gun. There are 120 millimeter versions, but most of them are 105s. That's going to do you enough to get us through till, as you say, the army gets there. And it's this big armored chunk of steel. If you look at our battles in the Pacific in World War II, the Sherman that had trouble standing up to the Germans had no problem stomping the Japanese. And what did the Sherman do? It trundled ashore. It went wherever it needed to go, and you had tons of Marines walking behind it. That's why, how do you tell a Marine Corps Sherman from an Army Sherman? The phone on the back. So the troops following can tell the tank what to do and where to go. And that, that still applies. If we're going to be taking back the first and second island chains, we're not worried about going 10, 20 miles inland. We're worried about establishing that beachhead and crushing bunkers. The armor threat probably, if it exists, will be minimal something in the PT-76 range. Hey, doesn't the Makava have mortars on it too? It does have a mortar. And if you want to go light, the light tank I would suggest you go with is the uh, Alvis Scorpion, uh, like the British uh, and the Spanish have used this for their amphibious armored forces. Very small, very compact, very light tank but highly capable, even though it only has a 76 millimeter gun, they do have a diverse set of ammunition for it. And uh, if that, if we need, if we want to go light tank, there's the uh, answer. I'm going to, I'm going to subscribe to the, to the light tank concept that we were talking about. I less, <laughs> I'm sure the Merkava is a, a great tank, but I don't know if it's good enough for Marine Corps, man, or for our, for our specific role. Uh, I mean, we're expeditionary. Uh, we're all over the place. I think back to, you know, Iraq, right? We go into Iraq with uh, soft skin Humvees, no fucking doors, no armor on them. And then, you know, we start catching IEDs. We start up armoring our Humvees. We make our Humvees too armored for the actual vehicle itself to the point that these things are breaking down all the time. So that leads into the MRAP, right? V-shaped holes, more up armored. Well, then guess what? MRAPs get so armored. They're so big that now they're not suitable for Afghanistan because they're so big that they're crushing the little uh, bridges and stuff in the wadis and everything else. And they're flipping and guys are getting trapped in these vehicles and drowning in these wadis. So we get the MATV, smaller concept, uh, smaller, more expeditionary uh, vehicle. It has a little bit less armor, but it's still very capable. It still has an armored hull, but it's, you know, smaller profile, still retains some of the armor. It's better than the Humvee, more suitable. Uh, to stand up against IEDs. Now we have the the JLTV, the latest iteration of this. We've learned all these lessons over fighting the the GWAT, and uh, you know it's that you see how we come up with all this. So what I'm hoping is, you know, with us divesting of our tanks, we look at the combat that's taking place in the Ukraine, and uh, we look at the the use of drones and everything else, and then we we take those lessons learned from this conflict. And we develop our own TTPs, our own new systems designed to counter those measures and advance it. But we make it in the smallest possible package uh, and we slimline because we have we have to get back on ships. We have to be expeditionary with the Navy. That's our job. That's our role. And that's what's going to keep the Marine Corps around for another 100 years. Hey, you know what, Brent? Um, that's an excellent point, too. Like, uh, again, Merkava is a fantastic tank. If, if anybody thinks I'm talking bad about it, no, I think it's a brilliant tank. Uh, and it works for is Israel to do the things that Israel wanted it to do. But again, this is like making a tank for Switzerland, right? It would look very different because they're not projecting their force. They just want something that works in their mountains. Well, Israel has their different, but nonetheless unique set of requirements. Whereas, uh, Brent, you bring up something. So first off, I was kind of joking around, but I, I really do have a consideration where the, uh, the Merkava, because how heavy it is, You've got to find the right vessel just to get it onto the beach. Hold on. Now it's very heavy. you got to get it off the sand. It's sinking in the sand. Wait a minute. We're not done. 
Because I'm telling you what the Army does when it takes its M1 Abrams, and it's like, what, 15 times less than the Merkava? Uh, the Merkava? Anyway. Uh, I don't know the equivalent. Okay, but uh, eh. um, anyway, the point is that now I got off the ship, I got through the sand, I'm pushing inland, and I can't get across any of the bridges. Why? Well, that doesn't matter to the Army. You see, it just so happens that the engineers behind me brought a bridge. But the Marines may not have, as an expeditionary light mobile force, they need a tank that can get across that average standard bridge. Um, and I, I mean, just everything about it. I'm saying it's not just the fuel consumption, um, nor is it merely the armor or armament it's all of the things that come behind the army on railhead um, that help us fight the fight that we've. I'm not sure that the Marines want all that. I wonder does uh, does Israel make a, a light armored vehicle that we could retrofit and make uh, make make suitable for the Marines? Maybe we could maybe we could buy you know a couple thousand of them and have them throw in one of those those Mercata giant land cruisers just for less. And then well, everybody here's the thing about the Merkaba. In the Mark IV version, the armor is modular. It's designed to take a hit. You unbolt that section of armor and bolt a new section on. You can increase or decrease the armor as you see fit. Also, since the 1980s, we don't go ashore in landing craft anymore. We go ashore in LCACs. LCACs are not going to be worried about putting the tank down the sand. It's going to go as far inland as it needs to go before it deposits that tank down. On top of that, what few landing craft we do are called the landing craft utility. They're big, long, huge bolt boats. They can handle three M1s, no problem. So the weight of the tank is not so much an issue. You're looking at logistical footprint. And I would say if you're going light tank, then you have to go so far to the other extreme, like the Alva Scorpion, uh, where lightness doesn't matter because like in the Falklands, the British found out the uh, pounds per square inch of a scorpion was less than that of a human foot, you've solved your bridge problem, You then your tank is now helicopter mobile by CH-53. And then you don't worry about how you get to shore. Well, yeah, now I think we're saying the same thing. Um, right, there you go, see, but that's, look how big that tank Look how big that boat is and that one tank. I don't know. I, I'm not a Navy guy, so I'm, this is outside of my bailiwick. No question about that. But it just seems to me like, man, a light tank. There's one M1 Abrams. It looks like it might have been able to fit a second one. And if you say that one takes three, then it takes three. But no, here's no, that's an LCAC. The, the, the LCU is different. But okay. The advantage of your LCAC there is that thing can go ship to shore at close to 40 knots. So... Yeah, yeah, it takes one M1 at a time uh, because of a balance issue more than a weight issue, but it's going to make that trip ashore three or four times before the LCU, which is a more conventional type landing craft, plods along at 10 knots. No, agreed, agreed. But you know what I'm saying. If I could bring four on there, you know, if something happens to one and I've got four and I go, man, something happened to one, something happened to two of them, I still have two more. Um, I think it's that, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, you've got a very shallow fight. You've got a very violent fight. Um, we are probably not hitting. Um, we're intentionally avoiding the enemy's uh, heaviest concentration. We're, we're gaining entry and we're going to exploit that entry with follow on troops in one form or another. That's going to be the army. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know. It just seems to me light offers uh some features that heavy doesn't but I, I you know but the marines have used heavy main battle tanks for decades now and they've used them very successfully yeah since the end of the second world war uh, marines have been using heavy tanks they actually went to the m48 series uh forward deployed before the army had fully deployed the m48 and then they switched up and stayed with the m60 a1 for a long time mostly politics Matter of fact, uh, you have to recall, how, how did the Marine Corps get the M1 tank? Well, in Desert Storm, you have first and second tanks deploying with M60A1s, then um, fourth and eighth tanks get called up from the reserves, and one of their commanding officers 
also just conveniently happens to be a Rhode Island congressman and calls his buddies in Congress and say, hey, pull those army tanks out of Germany and give them to us. So that's how the Marine Corps got its tanks. It got them from the army and just sort of never gave them back. <laughs> Not the first hey. time. <laughs> hey, hey, I'll tell you what. Position, man. <laughs> those M60A1s, and I think they were actually A3s at the time, and you know, I think they were A3s in um, – you know, the Marines were using, uh, but they did well oh, in that, battle. that second yeah. battle of Kopchi. Yeah. I mean, they kicked ass. They, they, re it was the largest tank battle. I'm told that's the largest tank battle the Marine U S Marine Corps has ever been in. And, uh, and they did really, really well. And remember this, um, uh, I think a lot of people kind of go, and eh, they were just fighting Iraqis. They were fighting a really good unit. That unit was disciplined. It, it was on the offense. It was not on the defense. The Marines were on the defense. They were rolling back in retreat. Um, but nonetheless, they just absolutely destroyed that brigade, knocking out something like 60 or 70 armored vehicles, half of those main battle tanks. So that M60A3 did really well by the Marines in the Persian Gulf War. A1, actually, Corps never had the A3. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay. Either way, I guess what we're saying here, though, is that makes you a little nervous. How'd you like to fight that battle again? Ah, there you go. Um, how'd you like to fight that battle again without your tanks at all? M60 or M1. And that's what I'm saying, man. That's where you go, you know what? A light tank's looking pretty damn good right now. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I any think, tank's better than no tank. You know. I think we're asking the the... Well, I mean, we've all agreed, like, tanks absolutely have a, a fine purpose, whether it's a heavy tank, medium tank, or light tank. Uh, we should be talking about, you know, countermeasures, right? So, obviously, the number one threat now is anti-tank guided missiles. And, obviously, those have been around for a while, but they've, you know, we're, we're experiencing more advanced anti-tank guided missiles. They don't have to sit there and be guided by a wire anymore. Um, you know, they can fire and forget in their top down attack. So my question is, we should be investing, not divesting of tanks, but we should be investing in new countermeasures to counter these top down attack and any other anti-tank guided missile. Uh, because again, it's a pendulum, right? We know the tanks are successful. The M1 Abrams is a successful tank. It's been slaying bodies since its inception. Um, we shouldn't be getting rid of it. We should just figure out how to freaking, you know, counter the latest threat, whether that's drones, you know, whether that's anti-tank guided missiles, new generations of them, or or whatever the case may be. Obviously, the M1 is a great tank. We don't need a new tank. We need new countermeasures to counter the threats of the day. Yeah, uh, and look how the um, countermeasures have evolved. Um, for example... Our M60s in the core in the 80s, when they needed to be uh, upgraded to face that Russian threat, they got reactive armor, the Israeli active armor system. But active armor, while it's great against heat rounds and HES rounds, doesn't do much against armor piercing, discarding, sabo, fin stabilized. You know, um, yeah, they're right there, the reactive armor. Um, so it's a somewhat of an improvement, but it doesn't protect you against everything. How did the M1 upgrade? Well, at first it started out in its original version with Chabam armor. And then in the A1 version, it gets the uh, depleted Uranian armor and whatever subversion of the A2 they're on now, it's hard to keep up without a fucking slide rule. Um, but I know they've made even more armor enhancements since then. <laughs> yeah, with you know, with with, with tank, tank defenses against stuff like that, you started seeing it really in World War II where German tanks were were not as up armored as they should be, so they started putting plate steel, bolting it on the sides. The idea was that as a round came through that plate steel, it was, it was initially developed for anti-tank rifles. It would disperse that round, but then they found out that that worked pretty well against shape charges as well. Then by that very end of the war, they were putting mesh siding on the tanks because they found that the anti-tank rifles were no longer being used, but shape charges were in that mesh would work to disperse that uh, shape charge before it hit the armor. The Russians did the same thing. You look at Russian uh, T-34's Battle of Berlin, a lot of them had bed frames strapped to the side and top because the, the bed frame, the mesh of the, of the, the bed frame would also destroy and we're seeing that in ukraine now you're starting to see makeshift mesh armor on russian tanks to help deal with the 
in-laws and javelins that are coming in also. I don't know how effective that is. Now, those tanks have reactive armor, too, and lots of it. It's one of the things that Russia did really well was develop reactive armor at the same time that we did, and they seem to bolt that stuff everywhere. I think that there are a couple of real problems are, and I think Brent mentioned it was with top-down attacks. Tank armor has always been and is still very thin up top. And so if you come straight down from the top in World War II, there you go, Brent, there's some bed frames. If, if you come, if you go back to World War II, you know, the big threat from top down was aircraft with anti-armor rounds. Uh, the, the Germans had them with, with big cannon and uh, the Russia had them with, with, tank, with uh, flying tanks like the, the, the uh, Sturmovich, and I may be mispronouncing that, the Il-2. But that's, that's not really changed because now even though you might not have an aircraft threat with a top down shape charge, then you're, you're just as just as prone to being destroyed from the top. So I think we're going to have to see tanks building up armor on top and finding some way to protect from the top, which may even be more important than frontal attacks. Uh, Looking at what's going on now where more and more and more of these shoulder fired weapons are, are top down. And I'll tell you that a couple of the other big threats that were mentioned and I think are worth talking about is um, yes, you've got issues with drones, and there are drones now that are being developed, uh, like the Sidewinder, which is essentially goes from being an aircraft to a top-down single-shot uh, missile capable of penetrating armor from the top. Um, and I think that one of the big things is um, also drones that are that are just using cameras to feed back to artillery or to other tank units. I think that's becoming a big deal. And here's something that I don't know how how they will defend against: satellite imagery. You've got satellite imagery that's real time being constantly fed back. We do. Not everyone does. There you go. There's another great picture of some some makeshift armor to protect from the top. So obviously those tank crews are so concerned with top down attacks that they are welding up and building some type of homemade protection to try to keep their 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 lid from popping off. Uh, this satellite imagery, though, I was just looking today. They have they have pictures of literally. They were showing like bodies in the streets from some of the, the Russian executions. It looked like you took a, a 4K camera and you were on like a 13 story building and you were taking that picture down. That's how good it was. That's coming from space. That's unbelievably good quality when you can start seeing individual bodies in high definition. And, and so you'll be able to also they're watching movements of tanks and things like that to launch attacks. How do you defend against that? We're starting to get back into the Star Wars question. Yeah. Okay. So a, a couple of different things. First off, um, uh, Kevin Stewart said, I, I, I think it's worth mentioning that he was saying, hey, look, um, infantrymen are vulnerable to everything. I mean, to 22 rifles. Are, are they obsolete? Come on, guys. Uh, just because a weapon system has its vulnerabilities doesn't inherently mean that it's obsolete. So there's that. I would also point out that Rheinmetall is uh, the German Rheinmetall is using um, very new modernized versions of the Beehive round. And they're, they're not shooting it out of 120 millimeters. They're firing this thing out of 25 millimeter chain guns. Um, and it flies out like three kilometers and they're using radar, you know, all of the different um, uh, heat um, so that they're watching drones produce heat, these tiny little drones produce heat and they're producing movement and they're picking this up three kilometers away and going pack, 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 pack. And the round flies, gets into proximity of the drone, you know, probably about 10, 20 meters out and then goes boom and becomes the beehive round, the shotgun round. And it, I'm telling you, I was watching it and they took down eight drones in like two and a half seconds. And I was like, good Lord. Now, I know it was done for demonstration purposes. The question is, is that going to be one of the many myriad of uh, countermeasures for drones? So, But the point is that drones are drones. And the point is that satellite is satellite. And tanks have been vulnerable all but World War, II, uh, World War I and the very onset of World War II. Now, did they have weapon systems that could, you know, tanks weren't undefeatable but you had limited numbers of weapon systems that could actually crack open a tank, right? Think about the first, you know, the Battle of Verdun, right? Um, you know, Cambrai, 
Well, the Germans found out that certain types of artillery pieces were much more capable of not only targeting and hitting the tank, but ripping it open. And so tanks have always been vulnerable to something, but you know, just how many of those artillery pieces did you have? And were they on the front lines where the infantry needed them when they were getting run over by, you know, Mark IV British tanks? And so that was the problem. As we said earlier, Kevin, um, it was shortly after the uh, German uh, conquering of France in 1940. Shortly thereafter, you see the introduction of bazookas and Panzerfaust and all of these wonderful anti-tank uh, mines. And so um, and so we, we start to see, uh-oh, they're figuring this, this weapon system out and they're figuring out countermeasures. As for satellite and many of the things, drones, airplanes, everything else, um, Brent, I'll, or I mean, Bruce, what I'll say is those are incredibly powerful, incredibly powerful. They're a force multiplier that must be dealt with. But here's the point that most people forget. You have to find the tanks first. Satellite imagery, as wonderful as it is, doesn't find tanks generally. Why? Because it's looking at, you know, 800 square miles by 1200 square miles. And it's going, okay, where are they boys? You know, I'm like, uh, no, 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 no. You need, you need generally humans find tanks first, generally. Uh, helicopter pilots and drone pilots are pretty good at going, oh, look, some stupid untrained uh, tanker went out in the middle of the field and, you know, hey, let's do our mud drive. And he ripped up the sod. And now I can see exactly where he's parked, even though he parked under trees. But generally, if they're pretty well disciplined, they know how to hide their, their tracks. And once again, you have to go find them with humans first. I, I just want to piggyback off that, Doc. Excellent point. And going back to my Iraq story, when the AV crewman said, enemy armor in the tree line, I remember one of my most vivid memories is getting out of that AV, getting online and starting to assault in this tree line. There were Marine Cobras flying overhead. There was multiple tanks, T-55s, BMPs in this tree line. The enemy was just there. By the time we reached the tree line, there was literally something out of a movie. It was like a little fire smoldering with a pot of rice. Like they were just there. The Cobras did not see it. So everybody's conditioned to this great, you know, amazing, you know, patchy gunship, uh, you know, thermal vision, like there's the tanks, heat signatures. I'm telling you guys, there was multiple enemy armored vehicles in this tree line with Marine Cobras outfitted with the same uh, visual systems that the Apaches and all the other wonderful shit that we see UAVs have on it. They did not see these tanks. Otherwise, they would have been sitting, they would have been sending freaking Hellfire missiles into that bitch. And they didn't. They didn't see it until the AVs were coming down the road and a freaking Marine crewman and a turret saw that shit. It was like fucking Iraqi armor in the tree line, you know, 800, 800 meters in front of us. Drop the ram, get these goddamn grunts out there to start, you know, send some small rockets. Hey, Doc, since you were in the 101st, would you say it was a true statement that the primary targeting system for the Apache was actually a grunt on the ground with a designator? Absolutely. This isn't to take away from their scout helicopters and many of the different things. You know, they also used other airborne platforms, even UAVs, even satellites to, that they could bring to bear. But the reality was... I don't know what the percentage is. I'd have to see data, but it, it just seemed anyway that we found them long before anybody else found them. And we typically found them by them shooting at us. And then everybody goes, oh, hell, let that yeah, bring lots of firepower over there. I'll say uh, another thing is, you know, you always see, everybody's wrapped around like the use of drones and all this other stuff. And, you know, obviously that, that's fantastic technology. Um, however, there are already countermeasures. And I think the Russians, you know, we're seeing some drone footage out of Ukraine with little man portable drones and stuff. Uh, I think the Russians are suffering from the lack of experience, right? I, man, going back to when Chad and I were in Afghanistan, 2011, 2012 timeframe, Guys had man portable electronic backpacks. There would be one Marine per squad, squad of 13 Marines, has a man pad or a man portable electronic countermeasure on them to protect against IEDs. The same type of 
electronic countermeasures can be used against drones. Uh, these little tiny drones, all right? These little these little fuckers that are flying around <laughs> that we're seeing this footage at. I just think the Russians they haven't faced anything like that. They're not thinking about it, and they and they were underprepared. You know, when we're talking specifically about Ukraine, uh, if those were U.S. Marines or U.S. Army soldiers going into Ukraine, you know, flip the script a little bit, there would be electronic countermeasures going up against those those drones. You would not be seeing that. Guys, we were in Iraq and Afghanistan for 20 years. How many, you know, ISIS, Taliban, uh, fucking Al Qaeda in Iraq drone attacks did you ever hear about, you know, that were successful? No, valid point. Yeah, there, there's there's a reason Russia's losing generals on the front line. You know, you don't we don't normally think of putting our generals on the front line to put them at that kind of risk. I don't know when's the last time America lost a general to some type of, of combat related fire, but the Russians have lost several. And it's certainly because they're being told to go to the front and sort it out. Uh, and that's not anything new to Russians. Uh, crew, there's plenty of photos of Khrushchev on the front lines fighting the Germans. Uh, Stalin expected that of his generals and, and they, they wanted to go hands on too, because they had families back home that could be disappeared tomorrow if they weren't performing at a high level. And I think that that's probably some of the same mentality that Putin has when he's saying, Hey, what's going on with these forces? And the generals go, well, let's move to the front tank and ride around and find out. But that is a, that is a sign that is, I think Brent said, that they are an inexperienced unit as a whole. Things aren't going as they had planned. And uh, they did not, if you had asked any of the Russian generals six weeks ago, if things would look like they do today in Ukraine, I don't think any of them would have foreseen that. Yeah, some of that can be cultural difference, Bruce, though. I mean, Look how many American generals died in World War II. And I think the answer is five, but two of them died of a heart attack, like bad health, um, where the other three were actually killed by combat. And I, I think it's five. And how many German generals died in World War II in combat? What was it, 65? Something like this. It's a huge number. And so there's cultural differences that have to be accounted for as well. But I don't doubt for a minute, you're right. Russians have a way of saying things aren't going well, general, get out there and sort it out. And so, um, you know, and, and maybe that's bravery too. But uh, I, I think it can be both things. It can be both a sign of, you know, how bad things have gotten, but it can also be a sign of lead from the front. And, you know, you can almost res you know, respect that. Uh, it's, it's not hard to respect, you know, that warrior level of leadership. Um, I do. I do respect that. And I and I and I don't oppose the idea that generals should have some skin in the game, just like their their lower level troops should. Yeah, well, they're the beloved generals, the one that share the the, you know, the beloved leaders, the beloved warrior leaders are those that share the hardship. Right. And so I think the Russian soldiers might actually while this is heartbreaking to them, they can say, Man, as bad as this is getting, I, I turn behind me and I see lieutenant colonels and colonels and generals walking this trench with me. So that's got to be that's got to send a message to them that I am here for you. Um, so you know this can be good or it can be bad, and we're going to see. We, we're again, we are seeing where the Russians are losing, and the best estimates right now are that um, you know I've, I've been looking and they're just swags, but they're swags uh, made on good. Uh, various open source intel. The best estimates are right now that the Russian casualties as of uh, the end of March were somewhere in the nature of low 30s. Now that includes killed, wounded, and captured. So, uh, but the captured is a pretty small percentage, but they were estimating somewhere, you know, 31, 32,000. Whereas the Ukrainians are losing somewhere around 24,000. Um, but then again, the Russians are on the offense. And the offense tends to take more casualties than the defense. The bigger question for us is, and we've bumped around it, is where are the Ukrainian armored formations? And maybe it is that they're gone now that we're hearing Germany's going to send, you know, hey, we'll give them a thousand BMPs. And, you know, and Poland's saying, well, we'll give them T-72s. It may be that they are either gone or they're expending very, very quickly. 
But either way, it's interesting that we're sitting back here going, yeah, tanks are dead, tanks are useless, tanks are, <laughs> and both sides are going, give us more tanks, you know. Uh, that's you know, I do find that interesting about both sides wanting more tanks because these are two heavily mechanized armies. You know, armor is their primary thing. And for all we're hearing coming out of the Ukraine, we're not hearing big tank on tank battles. Unless I'm just missing some intel out there. I'm missing it too, Les, but I got to think when you shove militaries that big together, and, and they're huge. You know, the thing is that with the Russian military, what we often are told is like, oh, they got, you know, a million people in their military and they can call them up and all this other stuff. And that's absolutely true. But what happened is we saw that early on that they were sending conscripts in the first couple of weeks and the conscripts were not faring well. And so Putin publicly announced here, I don't know, was it two, one week, two weeks ago? Hey, if you're a conscript, you're not going to Ukraine. And so he's putting his professionals in, all right? And that they're trying to do this, you know, shift where he's putting his professionals. And that's an interesting thing because, sorry, getting a little off topic here, but that's an interesting thing because his professional military in whole is only like, what, 250, 260,000? And uh, that means really for Ukraine, he has about 200,000 uh, professionals available, unless he's going to start pulling them from way off in the east and down in Syria. Um, he's just not got them. He's got 200,000. But, and I don't mean they're all professional, but Ukraine is not only on the defense, it is now pulled together something in the nature of 360, 370,000 uh, forces mobilized. Now, again, that's first tier, second tier, third tier, fourth tier. So don't think that they're all equal, but it is nonetheless uh, 360, 370,000. Even if you factor in the two dozen, uh, you know, the 24,000 casualties um, that they've likely taken, it's easy to see Ukraine is on the defense and Ukraine has the numerical superiority here. Hey, real quick, and then uh, I would like Chad, Chad to jump in. You've been quiet for a while, but uh, I just want to show everybody this is what I'm talking about. That is not a radio, guys. <laughs> that is an electronic man portable countermeasure right there. And they were required for every squad to have them. What you got, Chad? So I want to go off on a tangent here a little bit. Um, we're talking about the Marine Corps getting rid of tanks. Um, I've got a question open to everybody here. What what would be the, the next step, uh, inevitably, would be the Marine Corps getting rid of their air assets? What are your thoughts on that? Open to everybody. Absolutely not. I don't, I don't think that's a possibility because when you look at what the Marine Corps has to do, it needs Marine aviation. Like, there's no way around that. Yeah, it's the Marine Air Ground Task Force for a reason. I mean, to totally get rid of air assets – would uh, be such a major paradigm shift that it's almost incomprehensible. And on top of it, the Marines having air is codified by law. So, okay, all laws aside, I think this is where Chad might be going. And it's so saying, what if they got rid of air assets is like, what if you know the Marine Corps got rid of all wheeled vehicles or all tracked vehicles or anything? And we would say no, but they got rid of specifically tanks. So here's here's a, a counterpoint that kind of plays devil devil's advocate because Chad, my answer is hell no. I didn't want the Marines to give away the tanks. So absolutely not, don't give away your air assets. But here's the argument being made in giving up the tanks. I'm not saying the Marines, devil's advocate, I'm not saying the Marines should give up all air. I'm saying strike, fixed wing strike air. You want rotary, you want cargo lift, you want you, you know. Uh, troop lift, you want medevac, fine. But the Navy can do all your strike air for you. So no, Marine, it it cannot. Yeah. Well, this is the argument being made for tanks, that the Army can do all of it for you, the Marines. And I'm not sure that's true. I, actually, I'm 100% it's true. 100% certain it is true. If if the army is sitting there in great big cargo ships moving their tanks to help, then sure. This is like saying, well, the Marines went into Fallujah without tanks. Yeah, but the British and the U.S. Army came with tanks. And that's the ones that you know, Brent is referring to and Chad is referring to. They're referring to 
It was literally Army and British tanks. The Marines went into Fallujah with no tanks. But that doesn't mean tanks weren't there. And so if you're playing this game where you say, oh, the Marines don't need tanks because the Army's got them. I'm like, yeah, and they're just 60 days behind you. <laughs> I kind of, I kind of, that, you guys bring up some, some really good points. And Doc, I, I kind of agree, you know, on paper, on paper, I, I, you could say, well, repaint all those Marine aircraft with, with Navy or Air Force symbols. And then, you know, they'll just get on a cell phone and they'll call up the king of the Air Force and say, hey, we need some help. It's, I think it sounds good on paper, but, you know, I think, I think there, there may be a little more to it than that, too. I think that, you know, you think about a situation like Vietnam and you've got a Marine unit that's, that's being overran and they've got wounded that need to be pulled out. It, it, it takes men with real guts to say, I'll go in there and get them out knowing that I have a high likelihood of my aircraft being shot down in the process. And I think that a fellow Marine may have a little more skin in the game to go get his brothers out than somebody that's in the Army or the Navy. That may not be true all the time, but I think it's true part of the time. And I think that being a Marine leader, a commander, having to reach out to another another division of the U.S. military, such as the Navy or the or the Army, I think that that's probably more red tape and there's probably more second guessing and probably more unnecessary input being put into that than if you're, re if you're going, we have aircraft on standby that are under our umbrella of command and control, i.e. other marine aircraft that we can call immediately. I think that the comms would be better. I think that it would just be a, a the continuity would be better, and I'm and I'm just basing that on just a a personal opinion, not any real experience. But I'm betting that's the case, and I'm betting we've probably got plenty of examples where support was needed through other units. And I know this is the case in Vietnam, where Army units were de de depending on Air Force, and the Air Force didn't come in because of weather conditions or because of too much fire that they that that if had they have been army units they might have done it anyway and i kind of i kind of wonder about that that personal that personal connection between members of the army or members of the marine versus parsing it out between other units i, I don't know i i, I want to jump in here i'm kind of chomping at the bit i'm sorry but i i get what you're saying bruce and and there there might there might, in very isolated cases, be something to what you're saying. But the, but the reality is that the pilots, the A-10 pilots, the F-16 pilots, the Navy F-18 pilots, they're all very brave men and women who are doing excellent jobs. And there's been too many times in Iraq and Afghanistan and the Persian Gulf War and, 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 and Vietnam where ground pounders, I don't care what color their dress uniform is, ground pounders... Uh, they had their bacon saved by you know, flyboys with martinis and cool sunglasses. And and the truth is personal bravery is personal bravery. So I don't want to disparage any of them because I just don't think, Bruce, that that would happen. I mean, again, there might be some isolated incident, but I don't think that would happen. Let me back up what you are saying, though, Bruce. Um, I think this is the issue. And it, it gets to what you're saying. If I'm in the Army and I'm calling Air Force or Navy to come in and save me, and I desperately need them to save me, the question is, how successful are they going to be if they've never trained with me? This is where the Marine Air Corps really comes in and works with the Marines, is because the, the Navy's going, eh, that's, that's beneath me. The Air Force is going, eh, that's beneath me. But the Marines own Air Force, as I say, let me get this right. The Navy's Infantry's Air Force, because um, that's what the Naval Air is, right? It's the Navy's Infantry's Air Force. The fact is that they work with Marines, and they've trained together. And so it's not a question of who's brave and who's not. It really comes down to this, Bruce. Who's trained? Who's worked together? And who's going to be more successful? A Navy pilot that has never trained with ground forces in the Marines on this specific kind of mission, 
or a Marine pilot who has many, many times? It's more basic than that, Doc. You know, there are three things. Awesome picture. I look so awesome in that. <laughs> um, as, a, as an air winger, there are three things starch wing, fixed wing aircraft do. They knock other enemy airplanes out of the sky. They drop ungodly amounts of bombs on heathen communists, and they fly close air support. Now, in the Air Force, guys who fly planes that knock other planes out of the sky are in charge of everything. My proof of that is it's Congress that keeps the A-10 alive, because if it was left to the Air Force, there wouldn't have been any A-10s around for even Desert Storm. Air Force does not want close air support. Marine aviators knock enemy planes out of the sky as it's something to do on the way to do close air support. The Air Force has red flag. The Navy has top gun, all about knocking enemy airplanes out of the sky. The Marines have a thing called MOTS-1, Marine Air Warfare T Training School or something like that because we love long acronyms. That's a three-month-long school. It's about nothing but dropping bombs close to troops. And it's legendary and it's known from Vietnam to the modern day that even army units in contact will turn Air Force away to have Marine Air come in and drop the bombs. And that is the difference of why you never want your Marine aviators giving up their starch wings. Yeah, Les makes a great point. Uh, I've been at 29 Bombs and watched uh, Marine Air uh, do actual um, strikes, right? And they have simulated uh, surface-to-air missiles going up, and they have to do suppression of enemy air defenses before they can drop their bombs on those targets. And if they don't, then you start seeing these, you know, mock SAMs going up in the air. It's really, it's really cool to watch. But uh, CAS is where Marines are, like, make their money, right? <laughs> their their whole role is to support that individual infantryman on the ground. Now, my two cents. My two cents in this whole thing is. I can't ever see a time where Marine Air is handed over to the Navy or the Army. Um, however, with that being said, if you would have asked Lance Corporal Brent back in the early days if there would be female infantrymen <laughs> in the near future, I would have said, you've lost your fucking mind. That will never happen. And here we are today. So, I don't know. Dude, you just opened up a whole new topic there. Oh, we we've discussed this at length before. So, I'll tell you what, guys. Calm down, Doc. Doc calm down, Doc. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> we we got eight mics, guys. Uh, well, we're, we're gonna have to do we're gonna have to do another live stream on on female Marines in different roles and how you guys can determine if they're female or not if you're not biologist. <laughs> Hold on, we don't have Michael on here to to give the counterpoint, so. We'll save that for him. We'll ask him that question. <laughs> we'll go around the horn, guys. Uh, yeah, and, and we've had this conversation at length. Uh, it's been a, like a second topic of the night. So you guys can go back to some of the previous live streams and, and see that. Uh, anyways, let's go around the horn. Final thoughts, starting with Chad, to wrap this all up, guys, for we're almost at the two-hour mark. So, Chad, you got the con. All right, I'll keep it short. Um, we've been we've had a good discussion. Um, bottom line, tanks are far from irrelevant. Um, yes, there are cheaper weapon systems that can take them out, but uh, I don't think tank on tank is dead. Um, we don't know what the future will hold. Um, China's still a threat. Iran's still a threat. North Korea's still a threat. Russia's still a threat. Um, the military is kind of moving away from its counterinsurgency uh, focus to a more conventional focus. Um, I, I don't think tanks are dead. Not now, not ever. Um, like Doc said, you're going to want them on your side. when you. It's better to have them and not need them than need them and not have them. I'll leave it at that. I'll agree with that, Chad. Uh, better to, to have them and not need them than need them and not have them. Uh, and that goes for the, the air wing uh, side of the, the Marines as well or, or for any military unit as far as that goes. But... Um, I don't know. I think I'll say this. I, I'll say that my opinion is, is that tanks are not uh, irrelevant. Uh, however, um, they are probably less relevant than they've ever been. And it'll be interesting to see if that tr trend continues to go. And I'll go a step further and say that although the Marines are um, have, have essentially removed their tank elements for now, 
I have no doubt that they could revamp those and reintroduce those just as quick as they removed them. Just a matter of training up some some guys and uh, getting them and, and reacquisitioning some more uh, tanks. That's one thing Marines are really good at, I think, is being uh, that versatile. So uh, I'm not I'm not as concerned with it as maybe some other people are. I think I think some people think all oh, the Marines will never have tanks again. Uh, terrain and the battlefield dictates and depend, depend on the type of enemy that we foresee is in our future as that changes because we go from enemy to enemy to enemy and it seems to be rather extreme types of enemies from Germany to Korea to Vietnam to Desert Storm, Iraq and Afghanistan and now we're looking at a possible another war in Europe uh, I think that uh, we could change fairly quickly and adapt to that to those new needs that we have in terms of main battle tanks on the battlefield. All right. Uh, a tank is a weapon system. Uh, the last time it was a wonder weapon was probably 1916. Since then, it's had to reinvent itself. It's had to reinvent how it works with other combined arms to be effective. Um, and we see right now, we are right to ask, what does the future of tanks look like? I, I think that's absolutely a fair question and certainly been raised by uh, this panel as well as over the last month or two by many, many different sources. It is right to ask, what does the future of tanks look like? Tanks will be relevant until fire and maneuver are no longer relevant on the battle space. When fire and maneuver, which is two things the tanks give us, are no longer relevant, then tanks will be irrelevant. And that day may come, but we aren't there yet. You're up, Les. Well, the question is, can the tank survive on the modern battlefield? I think the real question is, if the tank can't, what can? And as far as the Marine Corps not having tanks, I think the truth of it is, General Berger just made a very hard decision. Would he keep the tanks if he could? Yeah, but it's really not his decision. Uh, tanks take up a lot of uh, room on the Gator freighters, and there's not that many Gator freighters anymore. And it doesn't look like the Navy's planning a lot more in their shipbuilding bu budget. So I'm sure the reason the Marines are losing tanks is just it's a simple question of we're going back to sea, we're going on floats again. There's only so much space and something had to go. All right. So my two cents on this uh, topic, if you guys have been watching this uh, live stream for the last couple hours, you probably remember this image I put up. This is one of the images uh, that was brought up in the opening statements. And this is from 1973, at least somewhere around there, Egyptian soldiers during the Yom Kippur War. All right. And that first day, the Israelis lost 100 tanks on the first day, guys, mainly to the Sagar wire-guided anti-tank missiles, All right? This is 1973. So what we're seeing here is nothing new. These anti-tank-guided missiles have been around for, for decades, and uh, tanks have just evolved in, in countermeasures and tactics. And uh, like Doc said and some of the other panelists have said, the tank's days are not gone. Uh, Doc had a great point about as long as maneuver warfare is around, there will be a need for tanks. So 100% concur with that. I think the uh, the Marine Corps divesting of tanks had nothing to do with the tank's actual ability to fight and its you know need on the battlefield, and more to do with enhancing our capabilities of providing the Navy with that anti-ship uh, capability and the projected war with China and what we need to do in that war. Uh, and what uh, Les said about space on ships, absolutely 100% had to do with that. It wasn't to do with the fact that a tank is obsolete or obsolescent. You got the president of Ukraine asking fellow, or not fellow, but surrounding nations that are uh, friendly to Ukraine's cause for more tanks and more jets. You know, that should tell you right there you know, despite everything you're seeing on the in the, the videos and the news feed about, you know, shoulder-fired missiles, obviously they're having a great effect, right? 
but the Ukrainians are still wanting tanks. They're still wanting armored vehicles for this fight. Okay, so that should tell you right there that they are asking for this stuff. They need them and want them. Uh, so that it still has a, a very big relevant need on the battlefield for armored vehicles, uh, specifically tanks. So this has been a great conversation, guys. Um, Doc, you did not mention sex robots. I was pretty let down. You're fired. What? No, we talked about them as a future tank crews. Yeah, but she didn't mention it in the final comment, so it was kind of a kind of a letdown. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we are like almost at a hunt, two hours on the dot. So uh, appreciate everybody tuning in tonight, and until uh, next time, same bat time, same bat channel. Have a good night. <laughs>